When you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, open them with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the final words of Jesus this morning. You know, final words are significant words, aren't they? Uh, We live in a culture in which we draw up a, a legal document that preserves our last will and testament. These are words of final instruction, words that have great meaning and significance and have to be notarized and, and, and the court recognized them. They're very significant words. And then there are other final words that are maybe not quite as important, maybe infamous rather than famous, maybe like, hey, watch this. I don't know, but we're going to be looking at some pretty significant words from our Lord and Savior. Words that are spoken literally as he ascends into the heavens before the disciples' eyes. As he speaks these words and as he prepares his followers to hear these words, they're words that are significant to us today. And I pray that what we do in these in this moment together is We look at these words, we find encouragement in them, but also I pray this morning that we find some direction and vision, particularly for us as a unique people of God called out by God to serve Him in this place. So this morning in the year of 2020 and perfect vision and all of that, we're going to cast some vision for you as a church from this text. So let's Look then to the Word of God. Beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 1, the Word of God says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for, for, during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into the heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do, you, why, are you, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him going into heaven. This is incredible. This isn't a story that was written down for us to think about how great Jesus was. This was an historical event that took place and was recorded for us. And we see in this event the majesty and the glory of our God. And as Jesus spoke these final words of commission to his church, to his disciples, his followers, he was taken from the presence to one day come again. And friends, do you realize we live in those last days? Those, those days in which we live now are the days in which Jesus could return to come again for his bride. And if that was a significant moment, then we live in significant days. So let's look to this text again and Let's try to find some encouragement here as we gather week in and week out to be sent out. Let's look to the Word of God for encouragement. Did you notice what Jesus did after he was raised? Verse 3 said that he showed them by many proofs that he was alive. 
We have some of that recorded. We have the instance where he came into Thomas and he said, touch my side and, and see my hands. You remember this and how he had come through walls and he was in their midst and then he was not. And it's recorded that he appeared to 500 at some times. We don't know all the things that he did, but by many proofs appearing to them, showing that he was alive. This to me is one of the most significant moments of the, of the historicity of the resurrection. Some people would say, well, Christian, you can be a Christian, but do you really have to believe in that resurrected Jesus? I mean, that just sounds so made up. Well, here are men and women who saw him and literally gave their very lives on this truth. Jesus is risen. He is raised. If it were a lie that these men and women had made up, why would they die a martyr's, martyr's death? These were not rich men and women. These were not people who were looking to gather an audience and build wealth and kingdom for themselves. They staked all that they had on the claim, Jesus is risen. He is Lord. And in those 40 days that he was with them, notice what it said. And during those 40 days, in verse 3, during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. I, I could only imagine what it would be like to sit with the resurrected Lord of all creation in that time period and hear him speak about his kingdom. Can you imagine the glory that would just fill the place as Jesus spoke about his coming kingdom and, and what was going to happen. And, and as much as we would like to just sit in and hear those conversations and hear those words, what, Jesus, were you saying to the people? What, what did you speak of your kingdom? All that we have is, and for 40 days, he was speaking about the kingdom of God. Here's my proposition to you that in Acts it's recorded that these men turn the world upside down and that their living after Jesus left represents what he was talking to them about. So for 40 days he's speaking about the kingdom of God so radically that it changed their entire orientation and the way they lived their life and they left that place and turned the world upside down. I guess the first thing I would say is the kingdom was the business of the resurrected Jesus and it should be yours as well. If Jesus showed, hey, I'm alive, it's me, now listen, I'm going to speak to you about the kingdom of God. Then there's something in our hearts as followers of the resurrected Lord that we should be about the kingdom and about its business and about its growth and about the exaltation of our Lord. Somebody should say amen or somebody should say oh me. We should be people about the kingdom. We don't just light this candle just so that we'd have something pretty on the stage. As a matter of fact, it looks kind of out of place and awkward. And why is it there and why don't we have two? And th this is to remind you, you are the light of the world. We have a message that has been burned into our heart and our life. It's so radically changed who we are that it affects every relationship that we have. And we must tell people about this King that we serve and this Lord who is merciful and this God who is great. For 40 days, he speaks about the kingdom. And he preaches the kingdom. And in the end, it radically changed their lives, but, but it took something more, didn't it? <laughs> because in verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? For 40 days, he's been talking about the kingdom, and I'm sure implicit in all of his conversation is the command, you will go, you will go, authority has been given to me, you go, you, will you do it now, Jesus? Is this the time that we go? There's, there's just so much to, 
to be seen in, in Jesus' response. It's a rebuke, isn't it? Verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. I, I'm old enough to remember, but not old enough to be caught up in how uh, Lindsay's the late great planet Earth. And, and, and 1988 was going to be the year of revolution. But I am and I have been around the church long enough to know that there are so many believers that want to be caught up in, is this the end time and is this the end time and now is he coming and what's going to happen now and is this going to be the time? And you're not too far off where the disciples were. This has been the question that has been begged of Jesus from the time of his resurrection. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And by the way, I don't know if you've been watching the news lately or not, but there's more conflict stirring up in the Middle East. And powers aligned in ways that, that seem overwhelming. And it captures our attention yet again. Lord, is this the time? Is this the end times? Are we living in that moment where all creation is going to be renewed and restored? Are we living in the, the very end of time when a nuclear agent and these questions weigh heavy on our heart and our mind? And some people fear with anxiety. Did you realize that Twitter... On Saturday, Jesus was the number one trending topic on Twitter. And it was in relation to everything that's going on in the Middle East. There ought to be something about a Christian, a child of God, living in the kingdom of God, that we're not so much consumed with what's going on at the end times, but we hear this gentle rebuke from Jesus where he says, is it for you to know times? The seasons? No. Here's what Jesus is essentially saying to them. There comes a time when your knowing demands your doing. You've heard me talk about the kingdom for 40 days now, and you can't just keep on asking me more, asking me more, wanting to know more, and just filling your head with knowledge so that you'll just be in some enlightened state. Friends, that's not what the Christian religion is about. Because Christianity is more than a religion. It's a relationship with the living God. And it's not about filling our head with knowledge and somehow mastering the scriptures and being a Bible scholar that makes us any more of a Christian. It's not about filling our head with knowledge, but it's being so changed by the knowledge of God that it demands our going and our doing. That's why he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses right here in Jerusalem, a little bit broader in Samaria, and then to the larger region, and even to the very end of the earth. You are the plan for the kingdom of God. Make no mistake, Jesus had no plan B. The church is the plan of God for ushering in the kingdom of God. Let me put it to you another way, what Jesus said in his review. Filling your head with knowledge about the kingdom is not near as important as being a witness for the coming king. You, you can't just sit in the pew week in and week out and fill your head up with knowledge and come to every Sunday school and Bible study and think, this is so good and you're so learned and so educated and just thinking that that is it, I've arrived it's funny how when people will talk about their church or their pastor or their Sunday school teacher, they'll say, you know, I'm just not being fed there. As though eating and consuming knowledge about God were the primary thing that we were called to do. Let me put it to you another way. When Jesus says, it's not for you to know this, you're going to receive power, the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Holy Spirit is given to do more than make a holy huddle on Sunday mornings. He looks to his disciples and says, guys, just gathering here and knowing more about the kingdom is never going to work. You can't just keep asking me and asking and knowing about the kingdom. You are 
are the witnesses. Go, be my witnesses. The Spirit is going to empower you to do this very thing. And oh, when the church embraces this mindset that we are the people of God sent on mission by God, when we gather together, we're gathered to go out. That is where the power of the Spirit is seen in the life of the people of God. Let me say it one yet, one final way. The church may be a place where you're fed, but it's primarily a gathering where you are sent. So when you gather into a building, that's not the church. You are the church, but this place where you seemingly think this is the place where I go to get fed spiritually is really the place where you're sent out. It's the place when you walk out the doors of this place it should be plastered on your heart and your mind. I am entering the mission field. I have been sent out by God. I've been encouraged. I've come into fellowship. I've been strengthened. But I am commissioned by God for a purpose. So primarily, that's who we are. First Baptist Church Duncan is a people who make disciples of all nations by serving people and exalting Jesus. That's another way of saying the Spirit has empowered each of us to go on this mission that God has commissioned us to, not just here locally, but to the farthest reach of the world. And how incredible that you've given more than $55,000 to impact missions giving around the globe. Every penny of every dollar you gave, what an investment. But more than just our finances, we are called to pray. We are called to go. We are called to give. I am so thankful to pastor a church where there are people who give and go and pray for missions so regularly. And by the way, tonight when we gather at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it's going to be a little earlier than normal. But when we gather this evening, this afternoon at four, we're going to have an opportunity to pray for the nations. We have families right here in our own church whose children are on the mission field and serving abroad with our mission board. We have others that are connected to missions globally and we get to hear firsthand, God, what are you doing among the nations? And Lord, let me join you in that work by praying. If you don't come on the first Sunday night of the month, you're missing an incredible, joyful opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God around the world. We make disciples of all nations by serving people and exalting Jesus. But I want you to, to hear just a little bit of pastoral vision at this point this morning. We, we've looked at the text. And by the way, when, when the angels watched these disciples, hey boys, how long are you going to stand in the sky? You need to go do something now. And in a sense, I just, just sense that that's where we are as a church family. How long are we going to stand around and watch? Or when are we going to be called into and embrace this call and this action that we've been commissioned and we've been sent? And it's really the, the, the repetition of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28. When all authority had been given to him, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And you hear the promise of that. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The promise of the presence and the power of God is associated with us making disciples. Is associated with us living for and being on mission with the living God, the returning King. And I truly believe that discipleship happens most naturally in small groups. I believe the way that you grow and mature, and as Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, is when you're connected to a small group. 
Uh, look around at your, at your neighbors this morning. Just look, look around, see, just turn around, see who's here. Every one of you is perfect. Perfect, perfect worship attendance for 2020. Isn't that incredible? Look at you. Way to go. Uh, maybe it wasn't worth clapping about, was it? Now you look around and some of you actually came to Sunday school. And you have perfect Sunday school attendance for an entire year. Usually we wait till the end of the year to give the pins and the ribbons for that. But we might start now. And there's something about being involved in a smaller group, but what I would encourage you, and really the pastoral vision for 2020, is that by the end of this year, a majority of our adults at FBC will be engaged in a discipleship group, a D group. And that's, that's different than Sunday school, and it's different than worship service, so it's something different than what I've already been talking about. It's great to be involved in Sunday school and life on life happens there. And ministry engages in those places. I, I believe that the Sunday school is the primary ministry arm of the church. And, and it's significant and you should be involved in a Sunday school group. And worship gathering is significant where we hear the word of God taught and we are encouraged by the worship and the way that we sing and, and look to God's word together. But I believe that there's something else that should be happening in our lives and that should be D groups. And D groups, you're going to have to help me with the screen because my notes didn't print. But D groups, let's go to the next slide, are an intentional group of four to six men or women who are meeting to mature spiritually. So, so pastorally, what we would like to see happen is for a number of these discipleship groups of four to six people meeting intentionally, regularly to be trained throughout the year. Now, the, the way that will happen is we're going to call it GED training. And so this isn't like your, um, this isn't like if you didn't get your high school diploma, you can get your GED. It's, it's not that. It, it's, it's, like, it's like this. We want our people and we want as children of God to be equipped in the gospel, evangelism, and discipleship. That should just resonate with who we are as the children of God, that we know intimately the gospel that saves us. And that we know it so well that it just rolls off of our lips and we can speak it plainly and clearly. And I'm afraid that there's somehow this barrier that happens in the church. Well, I just don't know if I'm qualified to share the gospel. I, I don't know that I'll have all the right answers. I don't know if I'll be able to answer the right questions. Maybe I'll say something stupid. Or if, if we could get the majority of our adults involved in D groups where we're looking at the gospel, evangelism, and discipleship, and we replicate that, by the end of this year, we're going to have an army unleashed and sent around this community. And, and I am anxious to see by the end of this year the majority of our adults engaged in these D groups with the intention of I'm not just filling my head with knowledge. I'm being sent out. I can live this. I can do this. And so your pastoral staff, we took a retreat at the end of the, end of the last year. We've committed initially to start these D groups ourselves. And so there's going to be a few men that will be involved initially, but we're also going to launch this on Disciple Life on Wednesday nights. So Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock, we're going to have GED training. If you would like to know what, what you can do and how you could lead a group and how you could be a part of a small group, you need to show up on Wednesday nights. Not this Wednesday or next, but, well, next we're going to preview it on the 15th, but on the 22nd in earnest we'll start. So some of you just need to block out right now. You know, I haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, but this is a significant thing. I need to be here. I need to be a part of this course. I'll be there at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. 
Now, I think this is a practical step but a practical way that we can lean into not only what God has called us to do, but what we've said as a church we are about, making disciples of all people by serving others and exalting Jesus. So let, let's, let's commit to that. But, but another part of our, our pastoral vision is not just um, seeing D groups form, but it's about going outside the walls of this building. So uh, you've heard it said from the pulpit a few times that what Sunday nights are going to be looking different in 2020. So in the month of January and through the winter months, we're meeting at 4 o'clock. And our Sunday nights are pray, go, pray, grow. So tonight when you come at 4, we're going to be praying for the nations. And some of you just, you hear that word, oh, we're going to be praying, and you just, I don't something within you recoils. Maybe you're afraid that you're going to be called on to pray aloud. I'm telling you, when you come tonight and you hear how to be praying for people on the ground doing the work of God in remote places and hear the stories of how God is working, you're going to walk away encouraged tonight. So we come and we pray, but then the next Sunday when we come, we pray and we, we, we come and we go. Pray, go. Now, look at this map here. This is a map of Emerson School District. Uh, and the, on the left there is between Highway 81 and 5th Street from Bodark all the way to Elk. That is a massive territory. And then it goes from... Uh, Forest Hill Drive up to Elk, all the way to N Street, there on the um, east side of town. Th this school is just about in our backyard. We have families all around this building that send students to that school, Emerson School, and why don't we reach those families? And serve them and show them the love of Christ in very powerful and tangible ways. Let's just zoom in a little bit. So if we zoomed in on that map, and, and oh well, let me talk about that first, yeah. No, you can go back. I should probably say this. I, I don't have my slides. By the end of the year, members of our church will make personal contact with a thousand homes in the Emerson District. That, that's what I see for us as a church. You say a, a thousand homes. Well, that, that's really not overwhelming. If, if only 40 of you showed up the second Sunday of every month, you'd have to visit two homes each. Two homes. If 40 of you showed up for 12 months on the second Sunday night of the month, we'd reach more than a thousand homes. We ought to, we ought to reach 2,000 homes by the end of the year. But, but as we zoom in onto that map, this is just the area between Elk and Elder, between 81 and 10th Street, there in that top section. That's, a, that's just a, a fairly small area, but if we highlighted that area, I wonder, how many homes do you think would be inside that small quadrant? Well, if we highlight it and we go to the next slide, it is 250 plus homes just right there. So next Sunday, when we gather, pray, go. Next Sunday, when we gather, I would love to send out an army into that neighborhood. 250 people. This is, you, maybe you can read this from where you are. It simply says, be happy. Underneath it, it says a simple study of the Beatitudes. So starting January 19th, and I know we've looked at the Beatitudes together as a church family before, but starting on the 19th, we're going to be doing a simple study of the Beatitudes called Be Happy. This is an invitation card. How simple, how easy will it be for us to come together, be commissioned and sent out, and just knock on some doors and say, hey, we're at First Baptist Church. We're starting a new series. We're talking about joy and being happy in the, in the coming year. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. Would you, would you be willing to join us? 
And as you make that connection, the Lord may open incredible opportunities for you to have gospel conversations right there in that very moment. Maybe an opportunity for you to speak about the joy and the happiness and the satisfaction that God has given you in Christ. But those pray, go, those go nights, they're going to be intentional nights that we don't just sit you out as sheep under the wolves. We want you to be intentional about your visits and we want to equip and encourage you in every step of the way to say we are making a difference and exalting Jesus in our community. And so the year 2020, I believe, will be a great year for us. We pray, go, that third Sunday night, we come back and we pray again. Because I believe coming out of that second Sunday night of the month, there are going to be stories that we're telling one another. There are going to be ways that we're encouraging one another. There are going to be ways that we can be specifically praying for our community. And we're going to be lifting our community up and saying, God, send revival. Lord, move with power. God, do a greater work in this community. God, strengthen the churches of Duncan. God, move with power among us. And it will be a great time of praying together. And then that fourth Sunday, every month when we gather, we're going to have a time of growing. Where we're going to open the word and we're going to teach. We're going to be encouraged by the teaching of God's word. And your pastoral staff is probably going to share in some of the teaching of that. It won't always be me. Somebody say amen. And we're going to enjoy times of being fed and encouraged from the word of God. So, So 2020 is a year in which you are being challenged, church, to be more than a holy huddle that gathers on Sunday, to recognize that you've been commissioned by your Lord and Savior, that you are a disciple called to grow in your faith. And I I pray that you are engaged before this year is over in one of those D groups. And I I pray that some of you just can't even hardly wait for the 22nd to come because you know that you need to be engaged in in gospel and evangelism and discipleship training. And and I I hope we don't have enough postcards next Sunday night. That, That I have more people showing up and ready to go than I have postcards made to send you out. Friends, this is going to be an incredible new year. Not not because there's some vision being articulated. But because when we as a people of God are dependent upon the Spirit of God and His power and we're crying out for Him to do a greater work, we're going to see the promises of Ephesians 3 that He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we ask or even imagine according to His power at work in the church. So this is what I'm asking of you, church family, this morning. I'm asking you to commit. I'm asking you to say afresh and anew, I'm all in. I I come to this place not primarily to be fed, but to be sent out. I want to engage in a D group. I will, before the end of the year, be leading or be in one. And I will commit to be here for pray, go, pray, grow, and I will go and we'll knock on 3,000 doors if that's what it takes. I'm asking for that kind of response and that kind of commitment. And I don't really want to make this an overly spiritual moment, but I do want this to be a commitment type moment for you. So in a moment when we stand and when we pray... If that's a commitment you're making, I don't want you to just make that in your strength and in your power and say, I can do this. Because our strength and our power matters none. I want us to come and move together as a church in humility and surrender to the Spirit and the power of God and say, Lord, by your strength and by your enabling, these things I will do. And if that's where your heart is this morning, then would you just come and take a moment to kneel here at this altar and pray that prayer of dedication and commitment to the Lord. I'm all in. Lord, I'm yours. I'm following you. And if there are other commitments the Lord is calling you to, if there's other issues that you're struggling or wrestling with in your own heart, I'm going to be standing here and I would love to pray with you. I'd love to encourage you. 
I'd love to just know how to join you in that. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray as we're all standing, as we begin to sing, you come and you respond with commitment to the Lord. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these final words that are so relevant to us. You have empowered us to be your witness. And God, I pray you'd move with power in your church. Lord, we long to see you do more than we could ever ask or imagine. And Father, as best we know, we want to come in this moment and say, Lord, we are all yours. We commit to you, so have your way over us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.